Hello, hello. Yesterday afternoon, I was listening to NPR radio, and that lady, I uh, forgot the name now, she was interviewing Elizabeth Smart. And um, that's the girl that was kidnapped about 11 years ago and held hostage for like nine months. And she wrote a book just recently, My Story, it's called. And she was talking about this experience that she had and um, the emotions and these interactions with those people that held her hostage. And it was very interesting for me to listen to her my nerves were all completely up, uh, totally like a, like a, I felt like a soaking sponge, soaking up that information because I heard a couple of things in this. I paid attention to a couple of things in this that other people would probably never, ever pay attention to or if at all, just subconsciously. And uh, since I have been doing a lot of psychoanalytic work in my life, I'm 48 years old, and I have done therapy since I'm five years old. So um, I have a lot of experience with clinical psychology. I've also gone to a training program to become a therapist, but I didn't finish it. I didn't finish school, I didn't finish um, the, my master's program that I was in for psychology because of my own personal problems. Of I was afraid to give presentations. It was so horrific that I finally had to quit because my professors expected every one of us to give presentations. Only one, my, my absolute favorite professor, Dr. 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 Monica Pritze is her name. And um, she has a doctor in medicine as well as a doctor in psychology. And she has huge background in clinical psychology, neurology, and the brain in general, and a total expert and a wonderful woman. I love her. I miss her. Um, I'm very sad that I can't see her anymore. I had to quit the school finally because um, Dr. Pritzel was the only one who accepted a written work on on the brain and I chose the olfactory system because that is where I get pleasure from, from smells. So I thought I'll, I will translate the, the olfactory system from the book Kandel Schwarz and Chassel, that big neurology book. And so that was fun. It was really liked it. The other sub, the other sub areas like Psychology 1 and 2, they didn't make too much sense. It was very stuck on uh, theories that were not even that valid for actual practice. And it was very tedious work because it didn't make too much sense uh, intellectually. It was just, it was straying away from the actual subjects. And so my favorite one was definitely clinical psychology, the neurological part of it. And also I like, I was very interested in the psychoanalytical areas, but um, knowledge has by now way exceeded the psychoanalytical era. So we are far more advanced because we were able to I mean, we all were able to look into the brain because of the, the great works of neurologists around the globe. So um, what I want to say about this particular 
interview that I was listening to with Elizabeth Smart is that um, this woman, Elizabeth Smart, she comes from a family background of rock solid social um, socializations, social support, a rock solid social network and social support system. And I never had that in my life. So if I had been adopted at age 14, I was, when I was 14, I had gained weight really, really fast at that time. I was terrified of my body becoming a woman. My body was growing so fast at that time with the breasts getting large and it terrified the heck out of me. It, I was absolutely horrified about this. I was mentally a child and it was almost like it, w it was almost like an, an unreasonable demand to to my mind the way my body was growing versus my mental state and so i gained weight really fast i deliberately wanted to become fat because i wanted to go back into the state of a baby kind of like a i wanted to be i wanted to flee into the state of being a baby really fat with a pot haircut i it's still there at age 48 not resolved not much resolved about it and um i tried all kinds of approaches with this um this is this is not easy to talk to talk to my camera about this and um if anybody sees it you know my hope is maybe i can somehow makes other people feel less alone with their problems. Uh, I'm probably going to trigger somebody's egos. Um, people who try to be tough when they see somebody open up like this probably hurts their egos because their egos are the ones who totally um, suppress all of that vulnerability. So if that happens, that's just what happens in life because we're not alone on this planet. We live with other humans and not everybody wants to suppress everything and not everybody can suppress everything. I'm, for example, a person, I don't have the ability to deny or to lie or to be dishonest to my, towards myself. I cannot do it. I can't suppress things. I can't be in denial about things. Everything is always there. All that, all the information, all the awareness about myself. It, it not only has to do with being a, a patient from a very early age. It has to do with the way my brain is set up. The anatomy of my brain is I noticed my anatomy, my brain anatomy is very different to most people's. So I've been wondering if I can ever maybe meet somebody with Asperger's and see um, if there are similarities. So far I meet every one of the criteria for Asperger's. Um, I've never been diagnosed with it because again, uh, in the past this was not even being checked kids weren't even checked for this. Um, there's a book out that's called Dips, uh, written by, I think, Virginia Axline is her name. And I think that kid had Asperger's, but again, that's there was the same era that I was growing up in, in the 60s. And he, um, they didn't have these there, there, there were very few physicians who were checking for this particular type of autism. 
and autism in general was not very known at that time. So today it's standard to check for this. Um, and I don't even know if they checked dips for, for autism. They just, uh, one woman, a psychologist, wrote a book about him, about his, his reclusiveness and um, didn't want to talk for a long time. And those are the criteria for it. And um, I did talk, so that was not, that, that didn't fit into that di diagnosis, actually. I did talk, and I was very artistic already at a very young age. I started painting when I was two. It was just the natural way for me to express myself. It, I didn't think about it at all. I just, I was actually compelled to put uh, a crayon in my hand and start to scribble something on a paper. So it was compulsive almost. And so this is where my big strength is in my brain is, is art. It's expressing through art. It's, it's being in this flow of art. You know, it's, there is no such thing as the, the white canvas scare or something. I've never understood why people have this, this white canvas scare. But now I, I realize it has to do with this feeling of, oh, if I want to paint now, I have to do it perfectly. And that has to do with unempowerment, that has to do with um, society, that has to do with peer pressure and with the parents expecting the child to be perfect. So, um, thank goodness my dad hasn't put this pressure on me ever. Um, although, in a way, he has. He has compared my brother and me always to Leonardo da, da Vinci and Van Gogh and people like that and Beethoven. And that's not very helpful because it's hard to match up to those geniuses. And so, in a way, he expected me to be a genius, and that was kind of hard. But at the same time, he, like, it was also not, it wasn't, like, really harsh. It wasn't in a harsh way. It was kind of hum in a humorous way. Still, it's still not good to do this to a child. Don't compare your children with people like this. Don't expect them to live up to those kind of standards. Because then, they, then they're not themselves, then they, they are afraid to be themselves. So there's a genius in everybody um, if we allow them to be. You know, just allow the child to be the way the child is and to express themselves the way they want to, the way their bodies have to. You know, not uh, give them any kind of template or guideline on how to do it. This is always wrong. But um, but but so this didn't affect me because I have a very stubborn mind. I have never liked instruction manuals on anything, uh, whether that's for building something or as assembling something or using something in the in the way that's designated. When I was a child, I used to take everything apart and I used to make something else out of it. I would open up the the heads of dolls. They were always hollow and um, because I wanted to see what's inside, this is, which is a psychological already, psychological sign that um, I knew something was troubling in my own brain and I wanted to, I was curious, I wanted to find out what it is, and so the next symbol that was there was the doll with this rubber head, and I cut it open and there was nothing in it. It just smelled strange, like rubber. <laughs> so, um, there's so much, so much for me to talk about, so many things, that's why I always come from one thing to the next and the next and the next, because it's there are so many things that are tied in to all of these subjects, and particularly the brain and suffering and emotional illness. And I wish I could 
talk to people about this too. I wish we could help each other. I wish I, I wish I could help you. I wish to make people less feel less alone. That's also something that David Foster Wallace was trying to do with his books. And I read part of his books. They are very depressing. And they press right onto my own pain. And I know exactly what he's talking about. I know exactly, or I, I think I know exactly what he's feeling about. Probably not exactly because he's a guy. And but the, the family circumstances that he grew up in and mine, are, they are very, very synchron. And I know exactly how that feels to grow up under this type of, in this type of intellectual society where there is just an unspoken pressure put onto children and teenagers as they're growing up. And it's always this unspoken pressure that you have to live up to those standards or you're going to be a failure or you're going to be a loser or an outcast or leprosy outcast or something. And so um, this is how I have felt because I have never really fit in. I've never fit in any, any group of people. What, whenever there was any kind of grouping I felt like I did not belong to it. So the the group that I that comes the closest to me feeling at home was actually at the Primal Center in LA at, with uh, Dr. Arthur Janoff and Dr. Franz Janoff, who are the ones um, the directors of that center and where I was doing my my training to become a primal therapist, but it would have taken me probably 10 or 20 years, maybe 30 years, until they would finally decide that I was um, ready to be an actual paid therapist. And I didn't have my master's even yet uh, at that time, and I was trying to do this, and that wasn't working out, and it's, it's very sad. It's my whole life is was ruined because of this fear of speaking. And I have fear. I have fear every time I take this camera in my hand, every time. But, but the urge to communicate is so big, even though I have the most communication problems that anyone could possibly have. I have this incredible wish to to bridge this gap between humans and myself. I don't have a gap when I'm with animals. The animals know. They know who I am. They know what I'm feeling. They know my agenda, my, my, my needs and all of this. They know that I'm loving and giving and playful. They know that my inner child isn't covered up by anything. The only thing that covers it, protects it a little bit is the fat layer. But that's not, that's just a, an emotional belief that it doesn't cover anything up. It makes things much more complicated. So what I was feeling when I was listening to that Elizabeth Smart interview was I was happy for her, very happy for her that she had grown up in this rock solid environment. And I'm not saying the, the Mormon religion is something to put on a pedestal. Absolutely not. That's the farthest thing from my mind to would to ever praise or put a religion up to that level. If any religion, I would say it is Buddhism that comes the closest to my philosophy. But if it's practiced as a religion, then it has serious problems again, and it has stagnations. As soon as, it's, uh, as, soon as anything is made into a religion, it, sh it stagnates. It's not 
free-flowing anymore. And same with Mormonism, of course. I mean, there are countless things that I could list that are extremely, extremely dangerous. And I think it has also had to do with her uh, being easily, um, easily persuaded by, by this guy, Brian Mitchell. He kind of he kind of hijacked this Mormon religion and morphed it into something else and and he knew exactly what these people wanted to hear and he used this in in order to manipulate people and um, when you're 14 you are like a tabula rasa you are a blank slate you are not you don't have the knowledge yet that somebody around 50 has or 60 or 70 you know the longer you live on this planet and the more you experience the more you read the more you observe the interactions between people the more you are Im immunized towards any of these type of manipulations that can come at you so Elizabeth, what I want to say to you is don't feel ashamed about this at all. Don't feel ashamed about having been manipulated by that Brian Mitchell, having been indoctrinated or as they want to call it, brainwashed. Don't be afraid of that word. Don't be afraid of that label because that's not, that's not your fault. That's not a fault that you have. That's, um, that's also a survival instinct. It's a plain survival instinct, particularly for that age. You know, you had, as you said yourself, you were, you were feeling like an empty shell. And he took full advantage of that. He uh, made you into a, into a puppet so he could use you, use you to his fullest. And so it wasn't until you saw your dad that you felt the security of, of coming back to who you really are in that moment. And that's wonderful. And, and that's also, I don't know how long it took you to to heal those wounds, yeah. Maybe I maybe I'll read your story, and maybe you talk about it in your book. I just heard about it yesterday, so um, I'm probably gonna buy the book. And I watched every film I could find on YouTube about it because I just find it so fascinating the the story itself. But then also in particular, this th there was this incredible ache that I felt between my ribs. This this ache um, of what if that had happened to me when I was 14, when I was, my body was an adult. For you it was exactly the reversed rather. It was, you were not um, physically ready to become a woman, but neither emotionally, of course. So p for me, it was my body was ready, but my mind wasn't ready, and it was extremely frightening. And I never had an emotional basis for myself. Um, that I never had a um, a security basis for myself for my childhood. The way I grew up, it was very chaotic. And my parents were trying to be progressives and it was the the values were weird and twisted and all based on ego and the kind of my parents are kind of hippie-ish in that way they were hippie-ish now they're in their 80s so they were they were like hippieish mini skirt. They put me in a mini skirt, and that's not good to do that to a, a little girl. Boy, that's awful. That's awful, frightening for a little girl. That that tension that little girl gets from from men 
it's absolutely horrific don't ever put your children into like provocative type of clothing that's for example one reason why I would never wear a skirt again ever 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 and that's also why I put myself into the most masculine clothes and haircut and no makeup and every time I had phases where I wore makeup I just felt I didn't feel like I was myself and um, so I felt always felt horrible on a skirt I had to quit that immediately or very short pants like shorts you know where you that are really short, showing a lot of the upper thigh. That's um, I felt very insecure about that too. I could see the stairs and I felt like I was naked and it felt absolutely vulnerable. And my husband, he, he got real mad at me when I threw that pants away. I threw it in the trash because I didn't like the way other men were looking at me. It was. Although I like attention, everybody does like attention, but then at the same time, it's come, all these emotional baggage stuff comes back up. And so it's very hard to deal with this. And so Elizabeth, is, she is able to show herself, to show her feminine side and, and, and this incredible strength of speaking publicly flawlessly there is no m in it there is no a in it there is no m in it <laughs> it is completely flawless and there is no high pitched or fluctuations in the way she talks not like me you know when you look at my video it's it's like you're looking at broken glass when you look at my videos. You, s you look at somebody who's broken, who is really broken, really broken. And I am at 48 still working on fixing and putting these broken pieces of glass back together one piece at a time. And I think I fixed some of it, but it is an endless amount of more pieces that I have to fix and I don't know if I will ever do it in this lifetime so and I kinda like gave up on that hope that I will ever fix all the pieces together but I have a lot more clarity and I have a, I have now I have a very clear guideline that comes from myself and not from the outside and that is the inner voice and that is that that one specific basic drive and that is to bring love and peace for all earthians equally when people understand that all earthians are equally important and deserve equally the same love and the same respect and the same protection then everything will become well and that is my bottom line drive being alive and I'll do anything I can in my power to move things into that direction and that is why I comment a lot and that's why I repeat my comments over and over again I've already gotten terrible hate for that from people and put downs and insults even death threats multiple death threats and death wishes addressed to me and it is because I have stepped on those people's egos because what they are doing with their lives is they are retracting into the, the badass mode the mode like where they don't care where they call themselves carnivores because they think that is somehow badass and where they go hunting and they think it is badass or masculine or it makes them look tough or whatever you know it's all ego and it is all mental 
and it is not real. That's not what your body wants to do. That's not what your cells want to do. That's not what your inner child wants to do. You're basically raping yourself by doing this. Every, even every nerve cell wants to protect the other Earthian, whether it's a dog or a cat, a rabbit or a human. It doesn't matter. Your nerve cells want to help and protect, but your nerve cells are forced into a connection, connectivity, uh, into a net, networking connectivity by your fear, by your ego that wants to protect you from being vulnerable. So so it it manipulates your brain connections to make connections that go completely against the nerve cells themselves. That's very sad. So and this is what makes me so extremely depressed when I see this happening happening on such a gigantic scale. I see so much because I get bombarded with action alerts and petitions and I sign every one of them. And my husband does too. And that's why we're together because we stand up for the animals together. He's my best friend. So, the feelings that I had when I was listening to the interview was, it's this pain. Um, I didn't have this foundation of total respect and love and being a total integrated part of a society. You know. and. Um, yeah, I mean, if I could switch, if I could, if I could switch, I probably would switch with her and decide to be having been raised like this, having been nurtured like she has. The feelings I had were, I felt like if this had happened to me, this abduction, I probably would not have survived it. I would have gone into a terror state or I would have screamed. I would have screamed and he would have killed me. I would have screamed the whole time. I would have screamed it, my head off. I would have screamed in my bedroom. I would have screamed the whole walk up that hill. I would have screamed the every single day on that hill out of the top of my lungs and he probably would have killed me then. And, but that's that's how I am. I'm somebody, I'm kind of like a, a, a dog. A dog does not make these connections of, if I scream, I will be killed. The dog reacts directly because the dog doesn't understand any of these. First of all, doesn't understand it intellectually. The that there are consequences. I would understand, yeah, he's gonna kill me if I scream, but the scream would come out automatically by itself. And um, so, yeah, I probably would not have made it and she made it because she was calm, she was calm enough to not react and panic. But then on the other hand, and maybe she was too cautious. So if she had been less cautious and been bolder, screaming out, maybe they would have rescued her. But there's no blame in, in any of this, you know. Never, 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 never uh, blame yourself, Elizabeth, for the way you have acted. And, and your, your face, in your God has helped you too. I know that for sure. And I think you probably have a very good God and I'm sure that not every Mormon has a good God. I am convinced that every single brain, because we're all different, even though you belong to the same religion, 
that the people in your religion don't all have the same image of their God. They have a different idea of their God. And so that's why I strongly believe everybody can make their own personal God and people automatically do it already, whether they know it or not. So I'm sure because you're a kind person, you have a kind God. Um, some other people in your own religion may not have such a kind picture of their God. Um, there's a story I would like to share about something I read on the internet, particularly for you, Elizabeth, because this is very interesting. There was this guy, he, he, he claims he used to be an atheist. Uh, in reality, he never was. He was um, brought up as a Pentecostal Christian or something like this, which is, a, a, this is one of the very harshest religions there are out there. They're very corporate, they're very manipulative, they're, they're very much out there for money and um, for controlling. And so he was raised by, and I don't like the word raised, uh, this is, my friend Annalise told me that this word is just wrong like raising someone, pulling someone, and stretching someone up or something. Um, someone, the way somebody grew up um, is, this is very, very, very important. The way people were trained, if this wor word is probably better, the way, pe the way children were trained by their parents, this has, this has a huge, huge impact on the person. And so this person who claimed he used to be an atheist and, that, and then converted back to the religion that he was growing up with, the Pentecostal, and he explained why, and I saw clearly through this whole thing. So what happened is he was beaten really severely by his dad every time he was straying just a little bit away from his dad's belief and it's his dad's ego, of course, that made him beat him and also has to do with the brain anatomy of having um, a very shriveled prefrontal cortex because the prefrontal cortex is very, very important in making the right decisions and, and not hurting someone, someone else. And they found out that almost all prisoners have, have a shriveled or like an atrophied prefrontal cortex and it's ve it's this is very dangerous for the persons and for everybody around them because they can't control their anger at all they will they'll literally lash out they will they will hit someone in a split second because they, there's no control of this there's it the thinking process doesn't go through the prefrontal cortex first and uh, uh, the prefrontal cortex together with the amygdala and the hippocampus it's a it's a circuit that's supposed to go through the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex stands for for reasoning reasoning a panic situation and c bringing calmness back um, lowering the action potential in the nerves so uh, and that is not happening in those prisoner type of people like the the guy the guy's father who was beating him when he was a child so he grew up um, thinking that his God, his Pentecostal God, was the same as his dad. You know, this is, it, it's just a link that he made that, that, that just naturally occurs. He's been beaten, so he thinks naturally his God is um, somebody also like, the, like a father who will beat him and, and hurt him real bad when he strays away. So when he was in his atheist, in quotation marks, phase, that was not really atheism, of course, a true atheist doesn't have fear of any god. So that's why um, in a true atheist this can never happen. But this guy, he um, kind of like was in a debate with his, or was like in a inner debate with his God, and he said, I don't believe in you. Well, right there, that statement says he believes in him, or he wouldn't be talking to him, right? So, 
and he says to his God, like he would say to his dad as a stubborn child, he said, I'm going to do m whatever I want to do. And in that moment, he said, his God slapped him and struck him down on the floor, and he was really shattered and had a headache and it was like a calamity and um, he believed this was his God who, who he thinks w is just like his dad and a very aggressive violent father and um, in reality if you do a rea reality check if you step back from the big picture you look at the situation you look at it from a neurological point of view you see this was a hallucination and this hallucination happened because of his belief so his belief made him have the hallucination and then what happened is he fell 100% back into that religion hook line and sinker as they say he completely converted back to the Pentecostal. I think that's the same as that Ted Haggard is. And uh, it's, it's, it is it is a complete corporate, nasty, war-loving, trigger-happy religion, and it is it's it's just unbelievably horrible. It's as as bad as that Brian Mitchell's religion. Uh, they permit everything and um, everything is great and pornography and probably child por pornography and animal slaughter and all of that. They think it's all good and killing the whales and whatever. And um, so this is this is this religion is as bad as the Islam. And um, but if we let this religion get out of control, which is already becoming very big, even among Latinos who had originally been Catholics. If this religion spreads any further, then it will become like the Islam, and it will they will go back 300, 500 years in, in time and in, in mental development, and they will start burning witches, in quotation marks, herbalists. And this is already happening in third world countries. So we have to be very, very, very alert about this. They are burning witches. They are burning innocent people who are collecting herbs in their environment on their hiking trails to make tea with or even help somebody with it who has the flu or whatever. Some harmless people that are getting into herbology and, and are studying the plants, the medicinal plants, they're being burned alive because they're declared witches. Again, you know, we have to be very, very, very careful about this. We live, um, most people are not informed on the atrocities that are happening in the world, and those are not just individual atrocities, those are, those are organized atrocities. Those are, those are the crimes that are a direct result of religion escalating. So we have to be very, very, very careful about it. Religion can be very, very dangerous. And but in Elizabeth Smart's case, she she grew up in this very stable religion, very stable. But it had to do with the people. The people made it stable, not the not their religion. So it is when when there's awareness and kindness and love and support then it really doesn't matter what religion it is it, it could be any kind it could also be islam if the islam became loving if they started to not do halal slaughter anymore if they didn't eat meat anymore if they treated the animals kindly and the children and the women what are they doing to the women? This is hideous, and they don't—they can't even see it because they're blinded through this blind rage of their religion. So if they became kind, then it wouldn't—it wouldn't be a problem for anybody. No atheist would get upset about this, and I'm not an atheist. So, but I do get upset about organized religions doing terrible things and. Uh, denying people information in school and those kind of things that that uh, will bring us back to the Middle Ages. 
It's very dangerous. It's dangerous for this planet to be in denial of global warming. So I was very happy when I saw that Elizabeth had this inner strength, this foundation that she could build everything on. And by the time she was 14, she had this incredible inner strength that had that she has received from her mother, father, sisters and brothers, and this very stable and very kind-hearted community that she had in her environment, and this amazing support group that she grew up in. And again, that's, uh, that had to do with the people themselves, not so much with the religion, because there are Mormons who are doing terrible crimes and who are very cold-hearted. But the particular group that she grew up with, they were all very, very kind and, and gentle and loving towards animals and children and women. And I would, I, I'm pretty sure that there was no such thing as any type of hate or like what I grew up in where the values were very much on materialistic things and on ego-based advancements or something. So that they, she had all the, the good values in her society and that's why she has this foundation of love and that foundation of love that also is her reflection on her God. So therefore her God has this positive picture, this positive image. But not all Mormons have this positive God. If they are cold-hearted Mormons and if they hunt, uh, I think that, um, that Ted Nugent is a Mormon. I, I don't know, maybe I'm mixing it. Yeah, I always mix Ted Nugent up with that Mormon uh, guy who was running for president. They look a little bit alike, so. But um, but I know Ted Nugent is a Christian, and look what he's doing. He's he's hunting and he is ridiculing the animals. He's making fun of the pigs that he shoots with bow and arrow, and those pigs have to die a gruesome death. And he takes enjoyment out of that. He gets, as he said, he gets a spiritual erection. Spiritual erection. Picture this word, you know, picture that. It can't get any more nasty than that. It is, this is, this is, this guy is a scum. I mean, it's, I mean, he's let himself become a scum, that guy. I don't know why that is. Maybe he doesn't have a amygdala or something. Amygdala stands for kindness and love and compassion. And so maybe that's it's not big enough in his brain. So people with Williams syndrome have very large amygdala. They they have they have um, other problems in other areas, but they have a very large amygdala. So they they have extreme compassion, and they don't discriminate between any species. So right there we see what true love is. True lo that is true love is like. When you see an individual suffering, you go over there, you run over there, you can't help it. Can I help? You know, can I give you protection? I'll put myself over a dog or in over over a baby seal in, in Newfoundland. I I will lay my body over the baby seal because I can't I can't do it any other way, no matter how scared I am, no matter how afraid I am of physical pain and torture. If I have this extreme love in me, I lay myself over that baby seal and I let them put the hacker pig into my back. That's all there is to it. I will do anything to protect that baby seal. That is true love. And people need to understand, they talk about true love all the time. And it's always in reference to a man and a woman. There can be true love between a man and a woman, but what people refer to is a cheap romance. That's not true love. You know, when they put love uh, as uh, like a heart and then love above sex shops or something, where they 
sell sex toys. That's misleading. <laughs> There's no love in a dildo. It's just a piece of rubber, right? It's a, it's a tool. So true love is when you feel compassion towards that other individual. Real compassion. When you want to, when you feel sorry for that other being, when you feel love and mother instinct, a mother bear, a mother dog, mother animal, you know, and that's wonderful. That's a wonderful feeling, you know. That's what we need to have. That's what we need to build up. And most religions seem to bypass this. Even in the Buddhist religions, I'm sorry to say it, the philosophy is going in the right direction, but then what are the religions making out of it again? What are they sanctioning again? You know, meet uh, here and there, and then, oh yeah, we're making an exception because blah, 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 you know. No, it's already going against what the Buddha was teaching. And I see the Buddha as, as the ultimate philosopher because he was not religious. He was not preaching a religion. He was a philosopher. He was a philosopher like Jiddu Krishnamurti. Uh, and I, I, see, I see the same energy in them, Jiddu Krishnamurti and the Buddha. And, and I'm certain there are many others in between that have that same energy. And then there are many other Buddhas out there too. I just saw a film about another Buddha and he was saying it again and again and again, the same philosophy. He has meditated for many months under a tree and when he came back out of the meditation he said very crystal clear, with crystal clarity, this is what we have to do. We have to stop killing or hurting animals for any purpose, for any, there's no reason for anything, medical research or sacrifices or religious ceremonies or slaughter or nutrition, whatever. There's no need to do it, no need to hurt or kill an animal. There's no need to eat animals at all. And he says not even fish, because they, they have a nervous system too, they feel pain too. So why eat anything that has a face, that has eyes and a mouth? So plants is what we need to eat. Plants, there's a variety of plants that we can eat that give us all the nutrients we need. 